may be seated. The Lord bless you. Take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter number 9. And I'm not going to preach long, team. I want you to stay ready. I'm not preaching long today. I'll tell you what Elizabeth Taylor told her eighth husband. I won't keep you long. Amen. But I want you to listen very carefully. Because I believe that God has something for us today. And I don't know if Gina's come back. Gina, my wife, is working with the children this morning and just sharing the gospel with them. And I, I'm excited for you to get to meet her. We've been married 35 years. And the first time I ever met her, I was, there she is right there. Amen. It's happening all over again. The first time I ever saw Gina, the spirit of hubba hubba came on me. Amen. And it's never left me. We've been married 35 years, got four kids. Three of them are in full-time ministry. And our son that's in business is the best Christian of all of them. Amen. And we've got three grandchildren. And two years ago, we sold everything we had. We sold our house with a swimming pool in the backyard. We sold our cars. We sold everything. All the kingdom of kingdom. Amen. And we packed it all up, sold it, put what we've got in a little storage unit, and we moved to West Africa to join in the mission of God for the rest of our lives, to see the Muslims come. They're coming by the thousands to Jesus. You see, what Jesus did in the Bible, he's still doing today. Amen. Amen. This is not just a religious exercise we're doing today. We're not just having church. Listen, the world is bored to death with church services. But what the world desperately needs is Jesus in the house. Amen. That's why your church is growing and seeing so many people come to Christ because this is not about a personality. It's not about a preacher. It's not about a program. It's not about building buildings and doing all the stuff that we, we are filled with church buildings. I'm from Texas. Listen, the only thing we got more than Baptist churches in Texas are beer joints and barbecue stands. I mean, they're everywhere, and they're dead as last year's bird's nest. Man, I, I'm going to preach it. Just get ready. Buckle your pew belt. Amen. Most of our churches in America are so cold. You can ice skate up and down the aisles, hang meat in the auditorium, and there are icicles hanging from the beautiful chandeliers in those auditoriums. High steeple, no people. What we need is a move of God. Listen, politics will never provide a solution. It's too late for politics. It's too late. We don't need an, an, an economist. We don't need a philosopher. What we need is a return of Jesus to the church in America. And when Jesus shows up, things really begin to happen. Amen. And that's going to scare some of you to death. Some of you thought you're just going to come to a little nice little church service. You're a guest, and you say, well, these people are shouting and lifting. We don't do that at our church where I come from. Listen, when Jesus shows up, God's Spirit begins to move, and things begin to happen. Amen. That's what happened in my life. Gina was raised in church. Her dad's 91 years old. He's preaching this morning. 91, still preaching the gospel. He's been preaching the gospel over, over almost 80 years since he was 15, still preaching the gospel. Her sister and her husband are missionaries with the International Mission Board serving a term. Her brother is a pastor, been a pastor for years. She grew up in the church. When she was seven, she gave her life to Christ. I didn't grow up in the church. Her daddy was a preacher. My mama was a prostitute. I grew up in a bar in a little town called Wichita Falls, Texas. My maternal and paternal grandparents were alcoholics. Nobody in our family knew Jesus. My mom was, got pregnant when she was 15. My dad, back in those days, you got your girlfriend pregnant, you got married. But neither one of my parents knew the Lord. They didn't have a foundation upon which to build a home. And so they got a divorce when I was a little boy. And then my mom quit serving alcohol to men and began to serve herself to men. And I saw my mom with one man after another, and I became a very angry little boy. 
By the time I was 10 years old, I was already drinking heavily. By the time I was 14, 15 years old, I'd become a teenage drug addict, alcoholic. I started running with the Mexican mafia when I was 16 years old, slinging dope all over, all over the place. I was lost. I didn't go to church. We lived in an area called the Dog Patch. And six blocks from the little shotgun house, unpainted, screen door on the front door that we lived in, there was a big old Baptist church. Six blocks from our house with a big steeple and a cross on top. And as far as I know, nobody from that big old church ever came and knocked on our front door and said to my single mom and my two half-sisters, hey, why don't you all come to our church on Sunday? Or better than that, why don't you give your heart to Jesus? I've often wondered what a difference it could have made in my mom's life and my half-sister Shelly and my half-sister Sherry and my life if somebody from that big old church would have just come and told my mama about Jesus. But as far as I know, Nobody ever came. And so by the time I was 17 years old, criminal, running with the Mexican mafia, I'd been arrested, booked on a felony, sitting in the Tarrant County jail cell in Fort Worth, Texas, lost, addicted to drugs, alcohol, my life on a one-way street to hell. And a month before that happened, there were three teenage girls in my high school, my senior year in high school, and they got a burden for my soul. Amen. How long has it been since you've really had a burden for somebody you go to high school with? How long has it been since you had a burden for a next-door neighbor or for a co-worker or a classmate or a teammate? These girls got a burden for my soul. And they began to pray for me and cry out. I found, later, I found out later that they had made a top ten list of the worst kids in our high school who they wanted to see get saved. And guess who made number one on the top of you? They put my name, number one. And they began to meet and fast and pray. They'd skip lunch, go to the library, make a circle out of their chairs in a public school, and they would pray and weep and get out the prayer list. God save Scott Camp. January 1980, in the early morning geometry class, I was already high. I got high every day on my way to school, and I was already asleep. I was also an athlete with a scholarship to go play college football. And my coaches would say, just let him sleep, and it's a lot easier to have class if he's asleep anyway and we need him in the game on Friday night. And so all through that year, my geometry teacher just let me sleep the first class period off. But one morning, Kelly reached across the aisle, and she nudged me, woke me up. And when I looked into her face, there were big tears that had swollen up on those big, beautiful blue eyes, and they were trickling down her cheeks. And she said, Scott, do you know what's wrong with you? Do you know why you're so dysfunctional? Do you know why your life's so out of control? I said, why don't you tell me? And she said, because you don't know Jesus. And she began to weep. She didn't talk to me about church. She didn't talk to me about trying to get my life together or my act together or quit doing this or quit doing that. She said, Jesus wants to know you personally. And then another girl named Debbie Malone said, Jesus, she said, Jesus loved you so much that he went to the cross. And I'd seen crosses all my life, but I never knew that what Jesus did on the cross he did for me. I never knew that when they ripped his beard out by the roots and spit in his face and beat him in the face until his nose was plastered across his face and his teeth were loosened and they put a crown of thorns on his head and beat him in, a, in the head with a stick until it drove the thorns deeper and deeper into his mouth. I never knew he did that for me. I never realized that when they took the cat of nine tails, the scourge, with a heavy club and nine long strands of leather and a piece of bone and glass and rock and metal, and they tied his hands to a vertical pole, and they began to beat his body until the, 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 the glass and the rock and the bone stuck in his skin. And when they ripped away the, the, the scourge, literally pieces of his flesh flew into the crowd until his skin hung like red ribbons down his back. And and his bones were exposed, and his nerve endings must have made his whole body feel like it was on. I never knew Jesus loved me that much. And she said, Scott, Jesus did that for you. If you would have been the only person that needed a Savior, Jesus did that for you. 
And then she told me how they nailed his hands and his feet to the cross and how he hung suspended between heaven and earth as though rejected by both and devil darkness surrounded the cross and the demons were saying, come down. And the people were laughing and jeering at him, saying, if you're the son of God, come down. And nails didn't keep him on the cross, man. His love for you kept him on the cross. And she said he did that for you. And then they took him down off the cross and they put his body in a hole in the ground and they rolled a stone over the mouth of the tomb and they said, we're finished with that dead loser. What's his name? That wannabe Messiah. That one who they call him Lord. Caesar is curious. Caesar is Lord. We don't need another Lord. We've got Caesar. And this guy's no Messiah. He's just another dead Jew. And for three days and three nights, his cold, clammy body lay in the heart of the earth. And then one morning on the first Easter... A former prostitute like my mama, who Jesus set free like he set my mama free. She came to anoint and embalm his body with spices. And when she got to the tomb, she found the stone had been rolled away. And the tomb was empty. And Jesus is alive. I say to my Muslim friends, you might be watching online, that Jesus is not a dead man. He's not a man who lived and then died. He's a man who died and now he lives. Jesus is alive. And a girl named Angela said, Scott, we've all been praying for you. And what a thing God could do in your life if you would just humble yourself and give your life to Jesus. And I'm telling you, the Spirit of God convicted me. Such conviction came onto my heart that my heart began to break. And in order to get out from under the presence of God, I got up, took God's name in vain, and stormed out of the class and said, I don't even believe there is a God. But the minute those words came out of my mouth, I knew they were a lie. And then that girl, Kelly, got up and she followed me right out of the class. And she was about this tall, a beautiful girl. She was very popular, but she came to the point in her life where she didn't care about being popular or about being a a cheerleader or about making straight A's or about having a new car. The only thing she cared about was Jesus and seeing Jesus invade our high school campus. And she put her little finger in my face and said, man, you're the biggest phony on this campus. She said, I'm going to pray for you every day until God changes your life. And then she just walked away. And a month later, I was on my knees in the Tarrant County jail cell with my hands for the first time in my life lifting my hands to the Lord and saying God if you're real and if what those girls said is real and if you can take my life whether I'm here another five minutes or five hours or five days or five years I'm giving you my life I've made a mess out of my life I'm giving you my life listen to me I cannot explain how God did what he did I don't understand it to this day Man, I've read a lot of books, and I've written books, and I've tried my best to help people understand, but there are some things you cannot understand with your little human brain. Amen. Some of you say, well, i got to have it all figured out before I'll give my heart to Jesus. Then you'll die one day and bust hell wide open because you'll never understand God. If you could understand God, you'd be God. Man, I don't even understand how a black cow can eat green grass and have white milk, but I like milk. Amen. I don't understand how you can just flip a switch and all the lights come on. I don't understand electricity, but I'm not going to sit in the dark because I don't understand. I don't understand my wife half the time, but I love her with all my heart. And I don't understand what God, God gave me a heart transplant that day. He took out the old heart and he gave me a new heart like air coming into my lungs. Christ came to live in my life. And when I walked into the jail cell, I was one person. And when I walked out of the jail cell, I was a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen. Woo, amen. And that one passion, you see, that one, I'm not a religious person. Man, some of the meanest people I've ever met in my life go to church every single Sunday. They used to sit about, you better move over, amen. I mean, they used to sit about, right, they've been there. Got a face so long, looks like they could stand straight-legged and lick buttermilk out of a gopher hoe and never move an inch. Amen. I mean, just miserable. Always in opposite. I'm talking about, I'm talking about church people who say they've been born again. And they're driving young people away by the by the millions in America with that mean, bigoted, you don't fit in here because thank God. 
God for New Season Church. Man, thank God. I mean, man, we don't care. We even let white people in here. Amen. I mean, we don't care who you are. We don't care if you're gay or straight. We don't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican, if you're rich or you're poor. The only thing we want to help you do is meet Jesus. Amen. Because if you ever meet Jesus, miracles begin to happen in your life. And that's what happened everywhere Jesus went. Mark chapter number 9, just listen to this. The Bible says they, when they were departed, Mark chapter 9, in verse number 32, they went out and they brought to him a dumb man. Now, there's a lot of those today. Amen. But in this case, he couldn't speak. There was a dumb man. Why was he a dumb man? Why, why, Why couldn't he speak? He was possessed with the devil. I landed in Africa and, uh, I got invited by a friend of mine to come way up north to the city of Tomale, where nine out of ten people are Muslims. And then 5% are traditionalists. We would call them practitioners of traditional religion, voodoo, juju, witchcraft, sacrifices of animals, even humans. The front page of the Accra where Gina and I live, the newspaper, uh, uh, had a story about a year ago about a fetish priest in the north who paid two teenagers to kill one of their friends, bring his body up to the north. He said, if you do it, I'll give you a Land Rover because we need to make powerful juju, powerful magic. So bring me the dead corpse of one of your friends. And of course, they were caught and they're all in prison right now. This is where these kinds of things still happen where I live. When you go into Tomale, you can feel the darkness and the oppression. Oh, it's so thick you can cut it with a knife. One of my African friends asked me not long ago, he said, man, he said, do you, do you have those demons in America? I said, oh, yes. Oh, yes, they wear suits and ties, carry briefcases, and live in Washington, D.C. Amen. I said, man, they're everywhere. Oh, yeah, they're everywhere. A friend of mine said, we we want you to come preach at our church. Now, this happened to be a Baptist church. Everybody say, thank God for the Baptist. Amen. I mean, a lot of you wouldn't even be saved if it wasn't for the Baptist. But this Baptist church wasn't like most of our Baptist churches in America. (laughs) I mean, man, our Baptist friends a month ago spent Uh, three or four days in New Orleans fussing and fighting about whether or not women can preach. Man, that was settled on the day of Pentecost when the Bible says, I'll pour out my spirit and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Amen. What I've learned in Ghana, man, God will use anybody. Amen. He said, come up here and preach at our church. I said, I'd be honored to. So I got up there, you know, in Africa, Pastor, you know, you've been a bunch of times. They have a lot of protocol there. So, you know, you have to have all these chairs up here and all the dignitaries are up there. And, of course, I'm up there, the old Bruni, the white man. Everybody's looking at the white man. And I'm up there and I'm sitting there. And all of a sudden, we're having praise and worship. And they're dancing and shouting and praising God. And uh, all of a sudden, a girl starts, a, a girl who was out of her mind starts charging up to the platform. And I found out later she was hearing the word kill, 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 kill. Well, some of the deacons in that church tackled her. Thank God for the ministry of tackling. Amen. (laughs) They took her over to the side. Church just kept on worshiping. They wrapped her up. They took some strips of cloth and they tied up her hands and tied up her feet. And I was just watching what was going on. And the Holy Spirit of God spoke to me and said, get up, go over there and set that girl free. And I said, Lord, I'm a visitor at this church. And, uh, you know, I've never even been in here and You know, they got people that can handle, this is Africa, and they got people who know how to handle that. And the Lord said a second time, get up and go set that girl free. And I said, 
What if I can't? And how many of you know when the Lord speaks to you a third time, he means business? And when it comes to those kinds of situations, it doesn't matter how many seminary degrees you got. Listen, you can't take one of your little frame seminary degrees and go over there and wave it around and make the devil leave. Amen. And so I got up and went over. And I looked down into the eyes of that. They were holding her. She was just frothing at the mouth and wild out of control. I looked into her eyes. She was staring right at me, just cursing in a language that I, I didn't know. And I said, in the name of Jesus, you come out. And it got worse. And I said, now, Lord, you brought me over here. We've sold everything we have, and you told me to come to Africa, and you brought me to this church, and this is a door that's open, and you knew that girl was going to be here, and you knew what was going to happen, and Lord, I need you. Come on, somebody. Lord, I need you. My seminary education and all the experiences I've had in a suburban church and all this kind of thing, and who you know, and who you've had your picture taken with, and all your little things that you, they don't do you any good. Most Christians in America don't have enough power to blow the fuzz off a peanut. And I said, Lord, I cannot help this girl, but Lord, you can. You can do it, Lord. And I'm asking you, Spirit of God, fill me. I'm not going to rely on anything, Lord. I'm just your vessel, and I need you to help me, Lord. I need you to fill me with your Spirit. And I looked into that girl's face, and for the first time in my life, I, I understood what the Bible says here about Jesus seeing the multitudes and being moved with compassion because they were like sheep scattered abroad, and they had no shepherd. And I began to weep when I saw that girl. And I knew the devil had tormented her. I found out later since she was a little girl. And I said, Father, I'm asking you, the devil has no right here. This is your child. You love this girl. You sent Jesus to die. And so by the blood of Jesus, in the name of Jeanette, girl was frost. She looked like a storm, a sea on a storm. I said, you come out. And just like that, her body became still as a glass she looked up at me her eyes cleared up I said smile I said Jesus has set you free I said smile and then she had sweat just all over her I took her by the hand I lifted I said take these things off her. she doesn't need them anymore you don't have to be afraid of her and she doesn't have to be afraid of you I said take those things off I took her by the hand I brought oh, the whole church was just staring I took her up here and I, I think I violated protocol you know I'm from Texas I don't give a rip about protocol amen I just put her down in my chair I took my bottle of water I let her drink from it I put it on my handkerchief the water I began to death I said what's your name and she said my name is Joyce and I said no your name's not Joyce your name is rejoice because Jesus has set you free amen <laughs> Woo! that's the power of Jesus that's the power of Jesus. The pastor said, we have to put this on film. So they have phones, they're just like we have. And they said, all oh, the deacons got around, and they began to interview her. They said, where are you from? She'd only been to the church twice, but nobody remembered her. She said, I'm from Bogotonga, two and a half hours away. She said, my grandmother is the main fetish priestess in our village outside of Bogotonga. And she said, I've been involved with her since I was a little girl. Now she's 16 years old. She said, I've been involved. I've been doing incantations, using my own blood and making animal sacks. She's been training me to be the next fetish priestess, take her place. 
She said, but I, I was so full of fear. I couldn't sleep at night. And I was just living in constant fear. And my mother had moved to Tomalee. And I knew my mom had met Jesus. And so she said, I made my way. I ran away from my grandmother. And I showed up. I came to church last Sunday. And she said, I came today. And the minute I saw you, she said, some voice and something overcame me. She said, I don't even remember what happened. All I heard was kill, kill, kill kill. And she said, the next thing I knew, you were standing over me smiling and telling me that Jesus had set me free. Well, I was back at that church six months later. And I said to my friend, Isaac Wooney, I, who was a former Muslim and came to Jesus, I said, Isaac, is Rejoice still coming to church? He said, oh, he said, see that girl right over there with a big smile, her hands lifted? He said, that's Joyce. And see all those people next to her? Those are all the people that she has brought to Jesus in the last six months. Amen. They brought a man that was dumb. He could not speak. He was possessed by the devil. And Jesus cast out the devil and the dumb spoke. And multitudes marvel and said, we've never seen anything like this at our church. Amen. But the religious scribes and the Pharisees, I call them the scabs and the parasites. Amen. The religious people. Who always look at their watch, wondering, now when's this, now we don't want to get too carried away here, and when's this going to be over? And I like a nice little sermonette to Christianettes who smoke cigarettes, watch TV sets, dress like majorettes, and can drive Corvettes. I like the American Jesus where we get it all over in 55, and let's don't get too carried away. And they begin to criticize, and I've pastored those kind of people. Every time I see someone like that, I want to say, sister, stand up and lead us in a word of criticism. Amen. I mean, always negative. They began to murmur and to complain, but it didn't stop Jesus. He just began to go throughout their villages like we do. Oh, listen, I can't wait for a whole bunch of you to come over to Ghana. I know Pastor loves East Africa, but he, he'll love West Africa too. And he'll bring a bunch of y'all. And I'll take you far into remote villages in the north where they have never seen my color skin. And when I walk through the village and I've got soccer balls, all the kids see me and their eyes get big. They think I'm a ghost and they run and hide. And then I say, I've got footballs and they come back. Amen. And, I, and we, 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 we go out and we... We set up an iron frame, and we get a bed sheet, and they don't have any electricity, and they don't have any running water. They wash their clothes in a muddy pond. I want to tell you, the American church is God's spoiled brat. Some of you, if your microwave doesn't work, you think the Lord has forsaken you. <laughs> About half the people in this room are backslidden. Because you love stuff. You got to have more stuff. I got to get more. 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 And three years later, you've sold it all in a garage sale. Why don't you start living your life for the kingdom of God? Amen. I'll take you out in some villages. And we'll get some plastic chairs and we'll get all the young people and give them soccer balls. And we'll say, go to the whole village and get your, your aunts and all your moms. Your, your daddy has five wives. Get all your brothers and sisters and all the wives and the aunts and the, uh, just everybody's family over there. Just bring everybody. And when we, we show the Jesus film in their language. And when we start the Jesus film, there's a hundred plastic chairs and they're all filled with kids and the sun begins to go down. And when the film is over and I stand up to share Jesus with an interpreter, I see five or six hundred eyeballs staring at me and I tell them what Jesus did in my life. And I say, do you want Jesus? And a hundred adults and all the kids come and I say, I have good news for you. There's no church. There's 30,000 villages with no church. Not a Catholic church, a Baptist, a Methodist, nothing. There's a mosque and there's a fetish priest. And I say, this man that's been helping me preach, he's going to start a church, right? You see this big tree? We're going to start a church here and we'll have these chairs. And we're going to bring everybody Bibles and we're going to teach you how to read. And we have a little cassette tape that's going to tell you about Jesus. And the next Sunday, over a hundred 
people show up and we start a brand new church by the power of God. Amen. Then we do what Jesus did. You see, look at me. He went around preaching the gospel of the, telling them, woo, telling them the kingdom of God is here. This dysfunctional world. You're doing a series on dysfunction. Let me tell you what's dysfunction. The whole world is in dysfunction. Things are not the way that God made them to be. God did not make people to be chained up by the power of darkness. You don't have to be an addict. You don't have to have your marriage fall apart. You don't have to be in rebellion against your mom or your dad. You don't have to have racism down in your heart. Jesus came, and when Jesus came, he brought the kingdom of God with him. Amen. And he established the kingdom, and the kingdom is the opposite of this world's kingdom. That's why we can never rely on the kingdom of this world to do anything. We cannot put our trust in a politician. I don't care what his or her name is. We, already, we don't need a politician. We have a king, and his name is Jesus. Amen. And where the kingdom of God is, there's kindness, and there's forgiveness, and there's freedom, and there's reconciliation. Amen. Yeah. Woo! Praise God. I pastored a church like this. Gina and I started a church in our living room, and seven years later, it had over 1,000 people coming, and it wasn't in a suburb. It was in the hood. First time we had all the, pro the property was all given to us because no church wanted to meet in church down there anymore. The first Sunday we met there, one of our members' cars got stolen off the parking lot. I said, praise God, we're in the right place. Amen. We've invaded the devil's territory. We called our church within seven, eight years. Seven years it had a 1,000 people coming. We called it the BMW Church, black, white, and Mexican. Amen. I mean, it was a third black, a third Hispanic, a third Asian, and, and, and whoever else. Man, it was everybody come. And the only thing we all had in common was Jesus. Amen. After we started the church, I picked up the Fort Worth Star-Telegram the newspaper in Fort Worth, and I saw a, a story. It was a human interest story because all they were talking about people coming across the border and everybody's so mad and this young man had come and he had become the leader of a Salvadorian group, a, a gang called the 18th Street Gang, very vicious. And it said that he was in a urinal at a nightclub in Dallas. And he said a rival gang member came up behind him with a butcher knife and shoved it through his head, had a hit out on him. And somehow the young man had managed to survive. And it said he was at home convalescing. And when I read that story, the Holy Ghost of God said, go see him. He's ready to receive Jesus. And so I talked to some of our other gang men. We, our church was filled with gang bangers and ex-prostitutes and strippers and businessmen and everybody you could imagine. And so I said to one of our former gang bangers who had come to Christ, I said, do you know this guy Servando? And he said, oh, I know him. He said, six months before I got saved, he said, I fired off six rounds. I was trying to kill him. I said, good. Then you know where he lives. He said, I know where he lives. I said, you're going with me. We're going to go see him. Just make sure you're packing heat. Amen. I said, we're going to go. I didn't say that. I said, we're going to go see him. He said, are you sure? I said, I'm positive. The Holy Ghost told me to go see him. He's ready to get saved. And so I took this young man, and we walked up with another one of our young soul winners, and we walked up, and we knocked on the front door of the little house, and it reminded me of the little house I grew up in. I knocked on the door. His little Mexican mama came. She didn't speak a word of English. I said, I've come to pray for Servando. She thought I was a priest. She said, come in, Father. I said, God bless you, my child. Amen. And I walked in. I went to the back. You will never win people to Jesus that you hate.
He was stretched out. His head was bandaged, blood seeping through. The paper said he was a stone-cold killer. He just looked like a young kid that needed Jesus to me. I said, Servando, Jesus sent me to see you. I said, I read about you in the paper. And I said, Servando, I know you know about Jesus because he had a crucifix right there. I said, I know you know he died. He did it for you. He's alive, Servando. Then I told him my testimony how I'd been in the same jail that he had been in and how I was a member of that rough world and how Jesus had set me free. And he began to cry. This stone-cold killer, tears began to stream down his cheeks. I said, Servando, do you want to give your heart to Jesus? He shook his head. I took a hand. The guy that tried to kill him six months earlier took another hand. We made a circle of prayer. Servando asked Christ to come into his heart. Two weeks later, he was at church all bandaged up. And we baptized people every Sunday. At that church, we baptized 5, 10, 15, 20, sometimes more every Sunday. And he was watching. He'd never seen it. The only church he'd ever been in was a Catholic church when he was a little boy. He asked the guy, he said, what, is, what are they doing? And the guy explained, their old life is gone, and now they have a new life. And Servando said, I want to do that too. Well, you'll have to talk to pastor about that. So they brought him to me. And Servando said, I want to do that. And I said, I'll baptize you in two weeks. It'll be Easter Sunday. But you have to bring a whole roll of your old gang to see you get baptized. And if, they, if you tell them to do it, they'll do it. Two weeks later was Easter Sunday. Guess who showed up? Servando. Guess who else showed up? Two rows of gangbangers. Guess who else showed up? The Fort Worth Star Telegram. And they took a picture of Servando, the gang leader, that they had done a human interest story on getting baptized. They put it on the front page of the, of the Star Telegram. They gave us the whole back page talking about a church that was reaching people that others said that it's not possible to reach them. We don't care about them. I'm telling you, when you move and operate in the kingdom of God, you are open to everybody, everybody, everybody. We started running a bus downtown Fort Worth to bring in the homeless. And there was a guy named Tommy. And Tommy was a homosexual prostitute. And he was raised in the church, raped by a deacon when he was a little boy. And so he wouldn't come to church. He was full of shame. But our guys kept reaching out. Get on the bus, Tommy. Come. And so finally Tom came. And Tommy heard about Jesus again. And he gave his life to Christ. And Tommy became an usher at the church. A man in our church hired him in his company. We got him an apartment, paid the first six months, furnished it with furniture. And if you go to that church, the first person you'll meet is Tommy, the former prostitute, telling you, welcome, Jesus loves you. Amen, amen, amen. It says he healed every disease. There was a young Muslim young man that had been saved. His name was Tariq Abu Bakr. And he was coming to our church. And one day he came up and he said, my dad is one of the, like a Sunday school teacher at the mosque. And he said, my dad just went, he said, my dad just went to the doctor because he had a cough and he said, they said, my dad has throat cancer. And it's so far advanced that there's nothing they can do. He said, but I've been hearing you preach how Jesus heals the sick. Pastor, does he really heal the sick? I said, he really does. He said, can I bring my dad? I don't know if he'll come or not. He's never been. He grew up in Palestine. He's a Palestinian, an old man. He said, my dad has never been to a church, and he didn't know how to take it when I began to go to church, but he's seen the change in my life. Hello, somebody. 
I'm talking to people and you're not any different from the lost people you work with. You laugh at the same junk. You look at the same junk. You're, you're the, you just come to church on Sunday and that's the only difference. The South is full of people like that. And as a result, young people, I'm going to tell you something about teenagers. They got a strong BS detector. And they can tell whether this is a religious game you're playing or whether you've really met Jesus and he's changed your life. I said, bring him. Tariq got his dad to come and his mama. These are Muslim people. I don't want to blow up Muslims. I don't hate Muslims. I don't want to deport Muslims. I want Maybe because we wouldn't go to them, God's allowing them to come to us. Have you ever thought about that? At the end of the service, I said, Mr. Abu Baker, would you come and stand here? And I just told him the story. I said, Mr. Abu Baker, we believe Isa. You know, the Muslims have respect for Jesus. They believe he was a miracle worker. I said, we believe that Isa is still alive and that he can still do miracles. So we're going to pray for you. We had our whole church gather around and lay hands and lay hands and lay hands and lay hands. Just like I'm going to ask some sick people in a minute to come. Matter of fact, if you're sick and you've done a miracle, get up and come right now. Get up and come. If you're sick in your body and you need a miracle, get up and come right now. Come on. Don't be shy. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. some faith-filled people just begin to come and stand around them. Come on. Some people who you've, you've been healed before. Come on. Come on. Let's get right down to it. Amen? Man, we've had enough church services. Let's do the stuff now. Amen? Let's see what Jesus can show up and do. So this is what we did. We had Mr. Abu Baker came, his wife, the daughter. We just asked our people, just come and stand around. And we laid hands. I didn't, I never touched the man. I said, we're going to pray and believe God. Well, you know what happened, don't you? A month later, he went back for his regularly scheduled doctor's appointment, and the doctor examined his throat, and the cancer, he said, Mr. Abbeck, I don't know what to tell you, but that cancer is gone. Listen, listen to me. Listen to me. The next Sunday, Mr. Abu Baker showed up. Guess what he said? I want to be baptized. I want to fall. And then the wife said, I want, me too. And then the daughter said, me too. So the next Sunday, we baptized those three former Muslims who saw Jesus not only die for their sins, but die for their sicknesses, die for their diseases, die for their freedom. Amen. And when you went to our church, the first row was the Abu Baker those Muslims. And man, when we sang, he didn't sit there just stiff. He had those hands lifted up. His feet were dancing because he knew the touch of Jesus. And some of you need to join these folks down here. Some of you, it's time to get real. There's no judgment for you here. There's no condemnation for you here. If you are battling with an addiction, would you come so we can pray with you? If you have such explosive anger that every time you want to see, you see somebody, every time somebody just says, you want to just fight, fight that, is, that is a stronghold that Jesus, that's not the kingdom of God. Amen. If you're a liar, a thief, if you're abusive, Jesus, you don't want to be that way. Jesus can help you. 
Can we all just quietly stand all over the place? If you have any issues in your life that you want, you've tried to, you've been to counseling, you've been to 24 steps, you've been to a dozen different rehabs, and nothing seems to help you, but you know Jesus loves you, and you know Jesus didn't just die to save your soul from hell. He, he came to give you life, abundant life. You don't have to stay the way you are. You can come. There's, there's, you don't have to live in disorder function. Amen. There's life for you. There's free. Just come on from wherever you are. And mostly if you've never given your heart to Jesus, which I don't want to beg you and you don't have to. The Spirit of God is speaking to your young person. Put away your pride. Mom and dad, put away your pride. Jesus loves you. He died for you. He rose from the dead. Matter of fact, here's what I want us to do. We're going to pray for everybody down here. And then you can just feel free. I want all of our, where's our youth pastor? That young man is on fire. Where's he at? Where, where are you at? Huh? Where's our youth pastor? He, he's probably on the highway picking up hitchhikers. Get down here. Come on. Our other staff members, get down here. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. I want all of the elders of the church, the de- whatever your title, it doesn't matter. If you're a person who knows how to pray for the sick, I want you to leave your seat right now. Come, let's stand right here. Let's lay hands on them and begin to pray and begin to ask God to do miracles. I want you to turn to every person, three or four, five, six people around you. Look at them right in the eye and ask them this question. Are you sure you're saved? If they say, I'm not sure, you take them by the hand and say, I'll go with you. You don't have to go alone. I want everybody to do it. Nobody leave, please. If you try to leave, I'm going to pray God will blow the transmission out of your car. Amen. Nobody needs and God hears my prayer. I promise you. That's right. Just bring your friend. Everybody turn to somebody. Ask them, are you sure you're really saved? Turn around and ask them right now. And if they say, I'm not really sure, just take them by the hand. They want you to help them. They want you to, yes, just like that. Just say, I'll go with you and bring your friend to Jesus. Come on, let's sing it. Yeah.